very pleased to have Mr. Lou Solo up here. He's, he's uh, one of the great trumpet players from New York City. He's played it with everyone from uh, uh, Maynard Ferguson to Gil Evans to uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. That's who I know him from. You know? And uh, he's just gotten back from Sweden, so he's a little bit jet lagged or whatever. But And this will be the only time he's going to be playing with two groups tomorrow at the same time, uh, the month group. Uh, and you can maybe a team or two, so this will sort of be a little bit of an open rehearsal and also just a uh, clinic, open question clinic, and whatever he wants to tell us. So, how about a little solo? Okay, I'm going to play a hot canary. No, <laughs> no, um, that, I'm just warming up a little bit. So, um, he wants me to play a song for y'all, so um, I haven't played yet today. I warmed up, but I haven't warmed up my higher register, but I'm working on it now, as you just heard. So um, I'm trying to figure out what kind of song to play. Why don't you play something? Can you play? Well, you're going to play. Three tunes with the band tomorrow. Right. And one of them is, is that rhythm, them? rhythm in. This is the band, so they know them. Uh, so let's in. play around midnight. Oh, okay. Oh. That's that's the one we need. <laughs> We're trying to learn here, right? Exactly. Does everybody have the, that arrangement with them? Okay. Yeah. Um, that that's one of those tunes where you know it can go a lot of different ways, you know, and uh, you we'll know some people sure know the intro. Way it goes. Right. Does it have the break in there? Ba, yeah. Ba, 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 exactly. Ba, ba. Exactly. Maybe I should see the arrangement too. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, want, you want it? You want well, it? just so I make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me. Get, I got copies. Everybody know the, the wonderful singer Cindy Scott? Yes. Yeah. Do you teach here, Cindy? Pardon? Do you teach here? You don't. I teach? have, but I'm not. I've been around now. So, what, you know, I'll just tell you, I mean, I don't know, uh, are there any brass players out here? No? Okay. What do you play? I play trumpet. And you? Trumpet. Trumpet. And I uh, have trumpet. Trumpet. All right. Well, what I do is I, I like to play with different sounds. So I, just for this, just for the, excuse us, just for the trumpet players, I use like four different mouthpieces. <laughs> That's a standard, what you call a 7th C. And then another mouthpiece, which is a, a copy of a mouth. Anybody ever hear of Charlie Shavers? Or um, Harry James? Well, this is kind of like the kind of mouthpiece they use, which has two cups in it, and it's a little bit brighter. And when I'm playing, when I'm playing in a combo, if I don't want to play anything high, you know, if I, if, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm older than I was when I was your age, right? <laughs> I'm 70 years old now. Wow. So in order for me to have a high register, I can't use the kind of physical e effort that say he can, or you can, or you can, on the <coughs> trumpet. So I have, I had to figure out an easier way to do it, which means a smaller mouthpiece. So I went to this. <laughs> You know what I'm doing okay? Mm -hmm. I'm just doing it. I improvise. That's what I do. So I'm improvising this. And I'm warming up trickily at the same time. <laughs> but. That's real pretty sounding. But if I try to go. You know, it's pretty hard to play up there. I can if I wanted to push it. But this one, almost as pretty, not quite, but almost as pretty, and a lot more projection. So if I was playing this ballad and there was a big band behind me, there's no question I would use this mouthpiece. Even if I was younger, with what I've learned about it.
and it's it's really not difficult. So if, if you're on a gig, do you switch to my pieces? Of course I do. Because because everyone, even though sometimes people come and hear me play, and they say, you know, Lou, you sound the same on all your mouthpieces. It makes me feel different. Like one like this makes me want to play like, like the, the famous man who's, the, to me, the greatest trumpet player who ever lived, Louis Armstrong. And it gives you, that tone is more in the spirit of Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie and, um, and Roy Eldridge, who were big influences on me. And then the, the and, and there's a way to make it sound okay, but like, for this, that's not hard because it's the right mouthpiece. And the way Lewis played in the in the end, in uh, not the end, but in the in the late fifties, if you watch him, if you watch a video of him, you know he must have been playing something like this. Because he's playing stuff like. But there's no particular effort because these mouthpieces are made to do that. And then, and then, I, and then when I when when I get on a gig like with John Faddis and Terrell Stafford, and it's time to play a ballad, and we've all already done the screaming and stuff like that. Of course, John, an octave, an octave above all of us. <laughs> but this is a French horn mouthpiece inside a, a thank you. <laughs> and then I'll be alive. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, brother. Anywhere. Thank you. Thanks, man. All right, no problem. <laughs> to me, the greatest sousaphone player in the world is that man. I've never heard anything like it in my life. Never. Of course, I've never heard another sousaphone player. No. no. Good coffee. Tuba, tuba sousaphone, whatever you want to call it. So on this one horn, I can play all those different colors kind of like a painter. So I like it. It's, it's like toys. They're toys. And I, and I enjoy crossing them over, you know. So... The trumpet is in the back. But right now, I'm going to play one mouthpiece on this and try to warm up with it. The solo. Yeah. The trumpet is in the Bible, right? The trumpet. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not expert on that book. <laughs> I'm not, but I know the truck. That ancient battle, uh, the the blew the walls of Jericho down with the shofar, and then the trumpet. So let's try this. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna try to. I don't. I know this. I know this music, but since I'm playing a new arrangement yeah. with them. Now what they what they're gonna do is that they're gonna divide up the intro. Uh, the sax and the trumpet over here, and then if you if you take if you take the melody to A section, you want to let them play the 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 intro. Okay. I mean yeah. that's kind of the way we Fine. rehearsing it without you, Fine. and then you, you play the melody at A, and Fine. then you come back in at B or whatever. But however okay. you want to do it. Um, I'm here to try to help and inspire all of you so yeah do it uh, you know if yeah. i, if I, I mean, say, that's just the way we no i want to play play everything yeah. what good is that <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean normally one guy plays it all but go ahead yeah. start it go ahead all right. <laughs> <laughs> what's your name miles. Miles. lou your name is what miles, miles. <laughs> oh man <laughs> <laughs> okay go ahead <laughs> So I should can uh, no no let's see the number you're doing it and then if if I don't like it I'll change it. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Thank you. 
Is that okay if we do this? Oh, now? yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, it's, 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 it's too slow for me. One, two, three, four. sounds beautiful. You sound beautiful. You sound beautiful. Um, what, I, what, I, what I miss, can I do this? Oh yeah. I, mean, I, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> what I miss is a little bit of drive. Okay. You know, which, um, a lot of it has to come, what's your name? Trey. Trey? Yes. A lot of it, ha um, a Trey, a lot of it has to come from you on the bass and generally, after we finish that, it goes into a more, you know, in other words, if, if a ballad gets slower, it dies. So a ballad has to be, you know, I mean, it depends. It depends on what ballad. But this particular ballad, um, hey, it sounds fine. What am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's everything is fine. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know what I was talking about. I think about. you Starbucks tomorrow. I'm fine. Just slow it down a little bit. So, when we get into the more aggressive part, 
first of all, when, 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 on the performance, I will be using a larger mouthpiece to play that melody. And then I would switch to play bop, bop, bop for the shock of the brighter tone. You know, I mean, I don't recommend it to everybody, but it's the way I like to do it. I just enjoy it and have fun with it. But, um, so let's, let's start from bop, 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 bop. And generally, even when you're playing the melody, make sure it keeps moving, not rushing, but moving. A sense of motion about it. You know what I mean? In other words, everybody sounds like they're, maybe it's because you never, I mean, I don't know why, but everybody sounds a little tentative. And I bet if I walked in and I heard you guys playing a gig somewhere, it wouldn't sound like that at all. So just, you know, I'm, I'm, I pretend I'm a, pretend I'm an eighth grader sitting in with you, okay? <laughs> Show me where it's at. Okay. Play with that attitude, okay? okay. okay. All right? Okay. One, uh, right one. Ba, 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 ba. One, two, one, two, three. Thank you. 
Yeah. How do you do that? Yes, Dakota. Sorry, we're rehearsing. <laughs> it's like a break, and then you kind of go into that Latin. Beat. I should definitely play that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But what, what's the tempo you guys have been doing? You guys sound great. Thanks. And if I have another cup of coffee, you sound like, the, well, no, no, I, no, you sound great, really. It's just like, it's just like meeting new people and being a little shy. And I, I have to say, you can't be shy when you play with new people. You just got to be aggressive and on it. You just got, I mean, not, you know, I mean, these guys are terrific musicians, I hear it. So, you know, it's just a, a question of, I couldn't, you know, my ears are stuffed from the phone, the, pl the plane, I couldn't hear the bass. Now, show me how you did, because I don't know how you did the end of it. Show me the feel you have on the end of it. Do, do, do. What is it? It's basically the same tempo, but... Yeah. And, and how does the tempo go? Do, 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 Okay, so I'd like to play that because uh, that's generally what's done. If that's okay. The beginning I don't care about, but the end I'd like to play. So like... Well, that, that was it. Yeah. You see, when I go... Do, 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 da, 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 and then there's a... It's, it's like, da, uh, uh, you know... Da, 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 And then it's a whole different tempo. And I picked it to temple by the speed of my eighth notes. Do, 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 da. Okay? So let's just take it from da, 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 da. And then it'll be Q&A. Okay? Okay. <laughs> That, yeah, that was right. It was just, that was, we'll, that we'll was, do that. We'll get it later. But now, I want to, hey, thank you. What's your name? Peter. Peter. Peter, Lou. Thank you. I'm Greg. Greg. I'm Roman. No, I'm Lou. <laughs> 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 I'm call you Roman. Uh, Lou. I like, you know, okay, so what I do, thanks, guys. I'm moving. I'm just going to just uh, not, not play uh, for a while, do some little QA. All right. Thank you. What I do is I like to improvise. I really, really love to improvise, and that's what I spend uh, most of my playing doing. I like to make the music up spontaneously. Um, does any any of the trumpet players have a mute with them? Anybody got a mute of any kind? I you know I didn't unpack yet. I got a hard on mute. <laughs> you have a hard mute. Oh, I'm gonna, can I give you an illustration of how I like to improvise? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let's just do two choruses of some song together. Me and you? Is that okay with you? Sure. And I'm just going to play harmony trumpet with her. Wow. Okay. <laughs> And, yeah, and just 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 a couple of choruses. Maybe maybe we do one to, we do one together, and then I have to find the right mouthpiece to play with the singer. It can't be a bright one. Okay. I know, but I'm, I I like to sing. I like you know. We're just starting. We're just starting. It's the first time. So uh, what's what's wrong with you? Like sure. What key? C minor. C minor. B? No, D minor. D minor. That's a nice harmony, man. Jor That's a nice harmony. Yeah, but it's a good Jorel. I could do it with C minor. No, no, I can. I, 
I, listen, another thing I do, and a lot of people, I work with, with uh, people on this, a lot of people are pinned to doing things in one key, or they can play a song in 12 keys if they look at the chord changes and they see like if, if, if somebody writes the chord changes out to giant steps or whatever it is in 12 keys, they'll look at the chords and they'll be able to play it. But ask somebody to play, try this as a challenge. You guys know Joy Spring? Yeah. Okay, try doing Joy Spring in 12 keys without thinking of what the chords are because everybody hears better in certain keys than you hear in other keys. You won't believe how many, or there's probably gonna be, most likely there'll be at least a key or two where you wind up coming out of the bridge and go into the wrong key. Because try to do it without the little tricks of knowing what the changes are. Try to do it with your ears, it's great ear training. So that's why when she says, what tune, do you, what key do you want to do it in? I don't care what key she says, I'll try it. So, okay, we're going to do it. Give me a tempo. And I, you know what? I just switched. I decided I felt it. I don't want to blow, my, you know, it's so much harder for me to play that 7C than it is for me to play this Super Chops 3 from Jerry Cowett. I mean, you know, when I'm, when I'm playing in a mute without a microphone, it gives me more projection without having to work for it. it. Gives me more projection. I'll just give you an illustration. Yeah, the tone's a little nicer on this, but it makes a big difference in the work effort. And uh, Mr. John Faddis, who can play more than an octave higher than me, um, always played the easiest equipment he could. Here's like... That's very intimate and it's very nice. But if I want to project a little more and it still sounds okay... life to it. So, as I say, it's easier. It's not a recording. If it was a recording, if we were doing it, I'd probably use the other one. But it's not a recording. So, let's do it. What are y'all doing? You'd be so nice to come home to. You'd be so nice by the fire while a breeze on the sings out lullaby you'd be on and I could be under stars chill by the winter under an August moon burning up you'd be so nice you'd be paradise in New York and I loved it and I came up and I and I said man you sound great you sound great Woo! but she was playing with the rhythm and I thought she went off but then I realized she didn't go off she knew where she was she was playing with the rhythm you know I, I, I just want to say that now that I know what you 
what she's doing and for the sake of them let's sing it let's sing it straight one time and then alter it any way we want I'll try okay I, I hear you <laughs> just you know I mean rhythmically yeah. so they hear exactly what we're doing together okay one two one two a one it be so that slow no, faster. Oh. Although it would be so okay. nice. One, two, a one. You'd be so nice to come home to. I think I'm in the wrong key for me. Huh? Can you play that again. I think I might be in the wrong no, key. No, you're in the right key. I'm in, I am? Okay, I'll try. One, two, a one. You'd be so nice to come home to. You'd be so nice by the fire. While a breeze on high sings a lullaby, you'd be all that I could desire. And the stars that are chilled by the wind, too, and under a longer season, you'd be so nice, you'd be paradise to come home to. And okay. All right. So now you know that we, we know what we're doing, okay? <laughs> so, now, I, now that I know the timbre of her voice, I hear another sound that I like better to do with her. So now do what you want, okay? okay? Just give me the tempo and so, will okay. you start and you do what you want. Okay. One, two, one. You'd be so nice to come home to. probably would have gone to what they call a cup mute. I think the most interesting thing is when, when you were when you were accompanying her, yeah. that you weren't stepping on any of her melodies. No, and no. High, high, I mean that was man, I, that, that could have, I, that could have been like a, a big band shout chorus or something. I mean the way it was written, the way you improvised that. That was really but, amazing the way you but, but, but you such see, clarity and you know, because it's like free counterpoint and it's not like you both playing whatever you want to do. I mean you're definitely listening to each other. Yes indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so so to me, what it's about is uh, improvisation, really. There's never a solo. Uh, the best players I've ever met don't take solos. They have conversations with the rhythm section. Hmm. That's why when you guys were laying back so much 
that you were listening to me and you weren't really playing because you were, were, you know what I'm saying, in the very beginning, until I got you guys more aggressive, it was hard for me to play because I couldn't converse with you. I need to converse with you, so you've got to feed me. I need to, uh, you know, I just need to, uh, it's like, uh, what really makes it, I mean, I, I even remember distinctly uh, being aware of this when I worked with McCoy Tyner in a big band. And I said to McCoy, well, um, let me preface it with this. When I was 21 years old, not much older than you, you're 19. Uh, when I was 21, I came to New York. It was a great scene in New York. And there was jam sessions that would happen every night down at a place called the Dom on, uh, on um, it was on St. Mark's Place, between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. Um, may he rest in peace, a trumpet player named Charles Camilleri brought me down there, a really good trumpet player. So, you can hear me all right, right? Without a mic? Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyway, uh, Charlie, uh, you know, all these players would come down there, I mean, Everybody would come to these sessions. Jack and Jeanette would play. Uh, everybody you could name would play at these sessions. It led, were led by this guy, Tony Scott. And may he rest in peace. So at any rate, uh, out of this jam session thing started Joe Henderson and Kenny Dorham. You guys know who they are? Yeah. They formed a big band. And they asked me to play lead trumpet with them. So I was the lead trumpet player in the Kenny Dorm Joe Henderson Big Band. I was scared to improvise one note around Kenny Dorm or Joe Henderson or some of the people in the band. I was just scared to improvise one note. And Uptown, I was the jazz player in, in, the, in the Uptown bands. But downtown with this band, we rehearsed five days a week for three hours a day. Well, and people like Spike Jones's father was the bass player. Let me just, uh, what, year, what, year? what? What year? This was 1965. Spike Jones's father was the bass player. Uh, Ronnie Matthews was the piano player. And um, the drummer was Joe Chambers. Remember him? Yeah. I mean, he's still around, playing great. And the band was filled with people. The, um, the trumpet section was a, uh, one of the greatest trumpet players I ever heard, a guy named Mike Lawrence, who at the time was 19, just turning 20, just getting on to 20. Now he is, and he, was, uh, he died a long time ago, but he's on one record with Joe Henderson called Power, of the Peop Power to the People. And, um, uh, even that isn't an example of how I know this man could play at times. There's no recorded example that's out that's as good as he could play of him. But um, at any rate, trumpet section was Charlie Camilleri, the guy who got me in, Tommy Tarantine, who was Stanley Tarantine's brother, who was a great trumpet player, a, a guy named Charlie Sullivan, who became Kamau, who uh, did some records and had quite a reputation as a jazz player, still has, <coughs> and five trumpets and myself. So at any rate, as I say, I was the trumpet soloist uptown, but downtown, I wasn't going to play a note in front of Joe Henderson. Are you kidding me? Joe Henderson freaked me out the way he played. I wouldn't play one. I was so shy. Let me tell you, I talk about you guys being shy. I was so shy that, I mean, in my day, you know, nobody came around to the schools in my day. You know, uh, it was like a guy named Donnie Lawrence, who founded the new school, said, Lou, come on, come on down. I'm playing with Clark Terry. I'll introduce you and you'll bring your horn. You'll sit in. I say, I'm not sitting in. Are you crazy? And I would leave my horn in. At that point, there were, sub there were lockers in the New York City subway station. <laughs> and I left my horn in a subway locker. I wouldn't go play with him. Are you kidding me? And so, so um, 
I'm all leading up to an incredible story about musical conversation. So I was too shy to play downtown with, with these jazz stars around. And, um, but Elvin Jones, who I've played with almost every great jazz drummer there is, and he was my particular favorite. I never experienced anything like it. Uh, very close second, Tony Williams. But, and I didn't play with Philly Joe in his prime, I have to say that, but I played with Philly Joe. And outside of Max Roach, I played with almost every single great jazz drummer there is. And uh, not Bill Stewart either, but um, anyway. So Elvin, you know, Elvin was so astute that he knew I could play by the way I played lead. And he came up and he said, I can imitate him a little bit. He <laughs> said, uh, hey, little, I'm playing at the five spot, you know. Um, and maybe, uh, why don't you come down and bring your horn? <laughs> and I said, okay, Mr. Jones, you know, I went like that. So I called up my drummer friend who became, you know, a very big commercial drummer, but at that point was a jazz drummer named Alan Schwartzberg, played on many of the disco hits you heard. And um, uh, I said, Alan, you gotta go down with me. I'm scared to go alone. So he went down with me and there was a line of horns because Elvin was such a generous man uh, with uh, letting people sit in. There was a line of horns that stretched along the hall the whole, I have, uh, along a wall, or maybe seven horns, including Ronnie Cuber, I distinctly remember that. And I said, at least I had the sense at that point in time to say, they don't need eight horns. You know, they don't need another one. So I didn't try to get up that set. And then the mission, I went, Mr. Jones, you told me to bring my horn. He says, all right, then come up the second set. You know? So he called me up. And instead of saying, let's play giant steps sideways, like at one point in the jazz world it was getting where instead of like, let's see how well we can play with this guy we've invited to sit into, let's see if we can mess him up. It got to that point. And you do hit that occasionally. Um, but it, it's, it's not good. The really the greatest players will never do that. Never. So, he says, let's do some autumn leaves. <laughs> so, you know, I'm 21 years old, man. You know, when you're 21, you're pretty strong in your instrument. So, um, you know, I, you know, and I knew autumn leaves, but I was so nervous that I couldn't play any of my fancy stuff. I could just play, you know, I could only play certain notes. But I couldn't play a wrong note because whatever note I played, the rhythm section made it the right note. They would listen to what I did. They would make it the right note. You know who that rhythm section was? It was McCoy Tyner on piano and it was Paul Chambers on bass and Elvin. And I've never, to this day, played with a better rhythm section than that. And that's what it's about. It's about listening. And I was leading up to this years later when I played with McCoy in a big band. I said, McCoy, I said, when you played in the John Coltrane Quintet, it wasn't really people soloing, was it? It was always a conversation. And he looked at me and said, of course it was. So a really good solo is being part of the conversation. That's what it is. If you're not listening to what's around you, you're just playing a bunch of notes. It doesn't mean anything. What means something, and if you notice that when Train would play and he would play all his sheets of sound, and I have to con can say that in my own way, I consider sheets of sound. I'm not driven, I am not personally driven to learning chord changes in intensity academically. Um, depending on the quality of your ear, you have to, to a greater or lesser extent. And of course, guitarists and piano players have to. 
But if your ear is good enough, what we can do on a, on a horn is we can play one note. Like what a piano player can do is play a million chords. But what a piano player can't do is something as simple as this. A piano player can't do this. I'll give you a better illustration in a couple more sips, and I'll tell you what. <laughs> Piano player can't do this. Piano player can't do that. Only a horn player can do that. Piano player can't do this. So we learn the characteristics of our instrument. Now the guitar players can do anything with the electric pedals and all this. So that's why Miles Davis got fascinated with wah-wah pedals and guitarists. And um, the other thing I want to say, and then I'm opening it up for Q&A, is that I don't think any of us should live in any other people's eras. <laughs> we should try to play the music of now. And one of the prime examples of that was the way Miles actually would play some of the same licks, but over different rhythm fields throughout his career. He started off playing bebop, which was, what was that? That was the current dance beat of the day. And it led itself into rap music. And Miles was in it all. And uh, for me, I like to play everything the only time I can play bebop, real bebop, really great, is when I play with people that lived there. I'm competent at it, but I'm never going to be like Dizzy. I'm never going to be like Miles. I'm never going to be like Kenny Dorham. That was there. The only chance that I have is to be a part of what my life was about, which is a different kind of music with more contemporary beats to it. And the same with you. You don't want to play like me, you want to play like you. Okay, Q&A. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. But trumpet? you got to talk who loud in, enough for everybody to hear you. Who invented the trumpet? Who invented the trumpet? Who invented the trumpet? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But, but well, I can just tell you that many years ago, in, um, you know, many years ago, the trumpet didn't have any vowels. And then it had keys. And the first piece written for the keyed trumpet was the Haydn Trumpet Concerto, which we all had to play. I mean, we all had to try to play anyway. And then uh, they moved it into vowels. Yeah? Do you use a specific method? You've got to talk to everybody Sorry, can hear you, otherwise, <laughs> you know, you, otherwise it doesn't make any sense when I answer. Do you use a specific method, method when you play lead? Like, um, like stamp or like, I mean, Costello method or anything like that? I could be really funny. There's women here. <laughs> I could be really funny, but I can I? <laughs> Frank West said to me, "You gotta tighten up your butt when you play." <laughs> but but no, the the method is uh, when I play lead. Yeah. I have a method of 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 musical what I do when I play lead in a band. It's the same thing. I don't try to dictate to the band when I play lead. I listen to what the band is playing, and I try to fit in with what the band is playing. And if you fit in well enough with the conversation, before you know it, everybody's listening to you. Mm. So that's what I would say. <coughs> Physically, yeah. you have to learn to play up in the, you have to use equipment that's right for the register, and you have to learn if you really want to learn how to play the, the, the register well, you have to be able to play softly up there in order to control it uh, loudly. One follow-up question. Yeah. What about articulation in the, in the high register? Because I've, I've found I, I've been practicing uh, high and I don't softly. think about it. I'm you don't think about it? I don't think about it. I don't think about it, no. I let the music dictate it to me. Okay. You know, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I was a pretty good classical player a long time ago, and I still have to do it. But I find that, you know, um, 
I need to practice articulation because I've lost some of it. You know, when you get older, your tongue gets slower, your fingers get slower. It happens. That's what it is. But, and uh, for a while I wasn't playing as strong until I, until I picked up, really learned how to play smaller mouthpieces and started practicing them. And then... Smaller cup, you play with a smaller cup? Huh? Cup size, you mean? Yeah. Because yeah. I've tried that and it's like... I, I tried the well, smaller cup. You have cup. to learn it. It's like a different it's, instrument. Yeah, it's like you're, you're using less muscles, right? Because it's a, you, it, it's a smaller it, diameter. Oh, it's, it, it's not only smaller diameter. It doesn't have to be smaller diameter, but it has to be either a double cup. See, I don't want to do too much of this Sorry. because we have a class not with trumpet players here. But it either has to be a double cup, like what the Charlie Shavers was and Harry James played, or it has to be, um, or it has to be a V shape or something. Of course, you know, there's exceptions. Nobody in the world ever played with the power, ever, of Maynard Ferguson. Ever, believe me, no one. When he was in his prime, no one ever played with that power. No one ever had the control of the upper register that John Faddis has. John Faddis, can play that note an octave higher any time he wants, soft, loud, any way he wants it, and probably go up above that if he wants. But as improvising, he freely plays up to that note all the time. Any other questions about anything? I'm not, yes. I'm not a trumpet player, or, but, but, but if, you, um, if you work on your upper register like that, does that mean, conversely, your lower register suffers? You have to work on your low register too. Can, can I mean, I mean, so uh, like John. Let me, let me, let me, let me, no. Let me just say that if you're a classical trumpet player, like my friend Sergei Nikaryakov, have you ever hear him play? Yeah. You ever hear Sergei Nikaryakov play? <laughs> you never heard anything like it in your life. Believe me. Make sure he hears him. Okay, Rondo and Capriccioso. You, you heard him, right? Yes. You never heard it. He's the greatest trumpet player probably that ever lived, classical, and. He's a very soft-spoken guy. He was better than everybody else when he was 15. And so when I met him, you know, we got to be friends. And he says, he says, I don't have much of a high register. I don't have much endurance. In the meantime, he's playing this crazy stuff you can't believe. And he's playing it, and he plays up to a, a high F sharp on the trumpet. And I meet him and his father, and I go to his house, and he plays me a tape of this. Of Rafael Mendez, and at the end, he goes ba ba da 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 ba ba, and he ends on a big high A. And I looked at him, and, I, and he was 12 years old. And I said, and then he played the Carnival of Venice, and he looked at me and he says, I don't think I can play it that fast now. You know, I mean, he was looking at a video, from, a video of him, 12 years old in a military little Russian uniform, and and I said. I thought you couldn't play those notes. And he says, he says, well, he says, um, you know, and when I was about uh, 13, I was able to play a double high C, but I thought it was affecting my tone in the middle register, so I stopped it. Hmm. So if you want to have the most beautiful tone in the middle register, and you don't care about the high register, you're better off just playing what the classical register is. It's like, uh, here we go with the trumpet again, but it's like if I didn't, I'm inspired by Dizzy Gillespie, by Roy Eldridge, by Louis Armstrong. I like being able to play especially being here, I like being able to play
enjoy being able to do that and without, without killing myself, without killing myself. And if I was going to play a 3C and do it, granted, Arturo Sandoval can do it. Arturo Sandoval can play louder than I can play playing my loudest note by going like this in his hand. <laughs> he can play louder than I can play. He's a bull. He's such a, a big man and he's so strong. But don't mis discount the fact that he practiced 10 hours a day when he was in the army. 10 hours a day. That's the real thing with whatever instrument you play. No matter how good you think somebody is or how much you think you can't do something. You look at Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker practiced for about two or three years, 17 hours a day. You know, so John Coltrane was never without the horn in his mouth. So before you think, oh, I'll never be able to do that, you know, try practicing 17 hours a day and see if you can't do it. You know what I'm saying? But of course, if you practice wrong on a trumpet, forget it. You, you, the, with a trumpet, with a brass instrument, the best way to practice is 10 minutes and rest five. 10 minutes and rest five. And then your endurance is great. But I'm not, I'm not here to talk about brass, so I've got to get off it. Um, but, uh, uh, but basically, um, Nikaryakov, anybody who hasn't heard him has got to hear him. And, um, and he's the one who told, uh, here I go, I can't stop. Uh, he's the one who said, Lou, if you want to keep playing as you get older, you have to play smaller equipment. And I said, and I said, so I played a 7C basically. And I, then I had a 5 that I was considering. I said, I said, what do you think? The 5 sounds better? He says, yeah, Lou. And a 1 would sound even better. <laughs> but play the 7. So for a long time, I was very dissatisfied with the sound of the smaller mouthpiece. And the Jerome Callet has this double cup. It stopped me with the trumpet. Please, somebody <laughs> ask me another question. <laughs> but anybody else? Because you, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, well, I'll just I mean, we should wrap things up pretty soon. But I just want okay. I just had a quick question about your career. I mean, when you're looking back in your career, uh, uh, do you find that most of your notoriety or most of your success or uh, the, the reason why people know who you are are because of the fact that you were a sideman or because you were a leader? And, and what 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 things would you? Uh, most of my notoriety comes from. Let me just get his question real fast, yeah, and then I'll do it. Go ahead. Do you think jazz is dead? What? Do you think jazz is dead? Mm. I don't like the... He said, do you think jazz is dead? I don't like the term jazz. I don't like it. Musicians never wanted to use that term. I mean, musicians thought of it as music. Mm. It's improvised music of the time. I think of it as improvised chamber music. You know, Duke Ellington didn't want it to be called jazz. Duke Ellington wanted it to be, to be called black music, and that's what it was at the time, in the 1920s. But it has become a world music, because there's Latin influences, there's Europe, well, there always were European in, in, uh, influences, but there's Indian, there's, from all over the world, there's influences in it now, it's a world music. So I don't even like the term jazz, even though, if I was to describe myself because I improvise over rhythm, I would say I'm probably somewhat of a jazz musician. But usually jazz is defined as ding, ding, ga ding, ding, ga ding, ding, ga ding. And I don't want to play that way anymore. That's a Although name. that's the common ground. That's probably what we'll, we'll do at the concert, because it's the common ground unless you have a lot of rehearsed stuff. Or unless you're playing with a funk band, which is actually, <coughs> actually what I prefer now. But it doesn't matter. It's all important and it's all good. So I'm going to get back to what he said now, okay? Yeah. So, <coughs> no, nothing's dead if you play it like it's alive. Yeah. That's what Nicholas Payton said. Huh? Nicholas Payton. Yeah, that's what, that, he's, he's reaffirming that that's what Nicholas Payton said. That's nothing's, good, that's good dead, nothing. nothing's dead if you play it like it's alive. There you go. That's, that's, that's a good thing. I play black American music. I don't play jazz. <laughs> well, it's... I don't, I don't think it's black American music anymore. I think, it's, I think it's world music now. It's become world music. That's what I think. It's world music. 
It's all, it's, it's everybody now. That's what it's become. If somebody wants to play that kind of music, they can play that kind of music. I want to play world music. That's what I want to play. Anyway, my career, really what I'm known for the most is 45 years ago, I got with a band that was so huge, that was so huge, it was called Blood, Sweat and Tears. Anybody even ever hear of it? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, don't say of course, many people have not. It's, you know, I mean, but let me say this, how many people have heard of Woodstock? <laughs> how many people haven't heard of Woodstock? Okay. I played at Woodstock the same night as wow. Jimi Hendrix. I played in a band that won the Grammy for the record of the year in 1969 against albums. I, I don't think it was as good, but against crazy big albums, one of which was Abbey Road. You know, I mean, it's, I, think it was, I think it was stupid. I think Abbey Road was a much better album, but it doesn't matter. We did something new at the moment. We incorporated jazz and rock, um, brought horns into it, and that's what I'm known for. Um, I've had a career both as a leader and a sideman. Um, now I'm known as a as a sideman and leader in uh, in real improv improvisational bands like the Mingus Big Band and. You know, out of many, many, many different things. But I've probably been a sideman much more than a leader in my career. And the reason is so silly, and it's coming to me now. It's the stupidest reason. And I, I tell all of you, it was because I never... Every leader I ever worked with, with very rare exception, one of them notably Maynard Ferguson, was disliked by some of his side men. I didn't want to be disliked, so I didn't want to be a leader. But, but, but the thing is, the only reason I would want to be a leader would be to play, play, be able to choose and play the music I love. But Louis Armstrong, you know, Louis Armstrong, all he wanted to do was play. Joe Glazer got his bands together for him. He chose his personnel. Lewis only wanted to get up and play. I'm very much that way. I want to play with the greatest musicians in the world. And when I, and when I have a chance to lead a band, I call them. I can't, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, um, I'm not where I can fill up a stadium with my own band so I can't pay you know enough money to hire Herbie Hancock you know or something like that although you know any of these guys I have to tell you any of these guys if they believed in somebody and they wanted to play with them they'd play with them for free or for nothing or for very very minimal money because that's what music is about if you turn down a gig because it doesn't turn them because it doesn't pay enough money and you really love the music, I think you lose. I really think you lose. I mean, let me, let me say this. A, a, a prime example is this one. I'm down here in New Orleans to play with Matt and I had no idea what he was going to do, what he was going to get me, and, or whether it would be very profitable or not. But I love the way he plays so much that uh, I wanted to do it, and so I'm here. That's great. And you never know what can come out of it. You never would never know what can come out of it. Um, for one thing, there's a fabulous band that Matt and I play with, with this unbelievable trombone player named Ray Anderson. Now, Matt, we can't afford to fly Matt up to New York to play a gig in the 55 bar where they don't charge admission and they give you some money, but you play out of a bucket that's been being passed around. Now, we wound up with decent money because the club subsidizes it and because we packed the club. 
But if there were three people there, I still would have loved it and I still would have done it. And if they handed me, I can't say I wouldn't be disappointed, but if they handed me seven dollars at the end of the night, you know, I, I, I still would have said, man, I love the music, it's okay. I have worked for as little, I'm not recommending this, but I'm just telling you, I have worked in a big band, there was a guy named Tom Pearson, who had like a 20 piece band and we'd play, and he'd always split the money evenly. And we'd make something like a dollar eighty three each. A <laughs> dollar eighty three each. He would split it to the penny among all of us. And but but he was a, a, a strange guy in that he you know, Gil Evans called him the the greatest unknown talent he ever heard. Hmm. Because he just wasn't after that. He now he's living in Japan and doing whatever he does. He, became, he started to become a big film writer in Hollywood. What's his name? Really, really big. Tom Pearson. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. Maybe, maybe something happened personal to him. But he all of a sudden quit it. Came back to New York, started doing gigs where we'd get a dollar seventy, dollar fifty one, maybe ninety three cents. That might have been the, lo the lowest, or maybe twelve cents. I can't remember. And he, because he said he would make an announcement every night. He says, "And I quit the movies because, ladies and gentlemen, to me, homicide is not entertainment. <laughs> you know, but." But it is entertainment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Tom played piano. Um, I'm studying acting now, and I'm learning a lot about, you know, we like to see things that we would never do. We like, why do you think we're all fascinated with these crazy TV shows that we watch? You know, every one of them has like, you know, people shooting each other and this and that, and you know. We don't want to do it, but we want to watch it, don't we? It's weird, right? Yeah. Anyway, any yeah. other? Have we done well, it? Well, I think we should. I think we should wrap it because okay. I want to give you a little break before the next. I'm you, okay. You, I'm but, okay. I don't okay. care. I'm, but, uh, I'm, I'm so wired. I don't. Why care. don't you? Why don't you plug you? I know you're playing with we, with Matt at Snug Harbor on Thursday. Yes. Tomorrow night you're playing at Sandbar with yes. with uh, the Monk Ensemble right. and also uh, with Brian Seegers Ensemble, who you're going to meet in a few minutes. But uh, right. Unless anyone has any other questions. Yeah. For, if you have for, questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Yeah. I do oh. have a question. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Pardon my humor. I can't help it. I, only for men, please. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. It's a joke. What, what is it? Um, as far as being like a versatile musician and playing with lots of different styles and new people and stuff like that, I just wanted to know about what you listen for. I mean, when you talk about listening, what you're listening for as far as like how to play into their sound. How to what? How to play into their sound and to how to understand how, uh, where you're coming from, how to reach their sound with your sound. And in different situations like sections or soloists or anything. But well, you saw the listen. illustration when we, yeah. when we did it together. Mm -hmm. I was listening intently to her, she was listening intently to me. Mm -hmm. So that we could fit in with each other, having never played together before, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I dare say it worked. You know, I mean it'll work a lot better when we get to know each other better, but it right. worked right away. And what you do is, what they do, to me, what they do, whoever they are, mm -hmm. dictates what I do. And then, all of a sudden, once I fit in with them, just like playing lead in a band, all of a sudden, they will be listening to me, and I will have my input. But if you don't listen to other people first, just like in a conversation, if you don't listen to other people first, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to listen to you. By listening to them, you show them a respect. Right? <clears throat> you show them a respect by listening to them, by considering their opinion, rather than jamming your opinion down their throats. So, um, you know, I mean, you know, if I'm going to sit in with, with Indian musicians, for example, I'm going to listen, what are they doing, what are they doing, what are they doing, and I might start off just playing a few notes until I hear it gel, and then I'll start doing more. 
So it's all, uh, you know, Elvin Jones says, what do you, what's the most important thing in playing? And his answer was one word, listening. Hmm. That's what it is. How about a hand for who's